Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Michael Pratt, a distinguished educator who, for a decade, was head of the prestigious Brentwood School in Los Angeles. He has recently published a memoir entitled Crash Course, a head of school, his son's addiction, and lessons for schools and families. Michael has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us today. My pleasure. So this must have been an incredibly shocking experience. You had just taken this, this uh, position at arguably one of the top independent schools in the country. And you are going through this process of getting to know people, getting to know your board. It's your first year. And your, your son is enrolled in your school. You're the headmaster. You're the, you're the head of school. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you have to confront what is every parent's nightmare. But you're confronting it while you're also managing a school. You're also interacting with the board of directors or the board of trustees. It must have been just an incredible cascade of events. Uh, his English teacher brought him into my office and said, David has something he needs to tell you. And what David told me was that he had eaten hallucinogenic mushrooms between his morning and afternoon exams and found himself unable to write his English final. What he didn't know then, I'm sure, and I certainly didn't know, is that he was already addicted to drugs and alcohol. And it would be a very long journey for him, five rehabs, six years before he got sober. So I was determined to use that experience to benefit other schools and families. What did you do? Where did you prioritize? Well, it was a profoundly difficult time, personally and professionally, because this, of course, played out in the most public way. I was first concerned about the integrity of the school. My son was just another student who had made a big mistake. So I understood that my credibility was on the line here. So how I comported myself would make a huge difference in my leadership and thus success in the school. I addressed the issue with my board chair who handled the job just brilliantly. Beyond that, I became increasingly concerned about my son's health as it became clear that he was not just dallying with drugs, he was an addict. And so his mother and I had to make that our top priority. In the school, I was determined to use this experience that our family had uh, suffered from to better the experience of other students and their families. So we put in place a number of policy changes. We also put in place a number of programs that were meant to create a culture that was more open and more supportive while continuing to maintain the integrity of the school. When you get rid of a zero tolerance policy, even if it wasn't explicitly implemented previously, aren't you opening yourself up as a head of school of being soft, quote unquote, mm -hmm. soft on uh, people who uh, break their commitment or, or are engaging in, in practices that aren't illegal? Aren't you um, suddenly viewed as somebody who is tolerating that which uh, should not be tolerated? Well, I knew I was running a risk. Uh, just that risk, in fact. And there was some criticism. Uh, my argument consistently at that time was that the first purpose of a school is to educate, not to punish. And that the use is so widespread, schools, in fact, cannot punish their way out of the problem. So they have to find a better way. And so long as the student and the student's family are engaging with the school and trying to get better, then I think the school owes it to them to support them in that way, which you cannot do with zero tolerance. Uh, interestingly, since 1956, the American Medical Association has identified addiction as a disease, a complex brain disease, but we still tend to regard it as a purely behavioral matter, and why don't they just stop? Right. Well, many addicts would love to stop, but they can't. How do, do parents, friends, first of all, recognize the signs that their child or their friend um, uh, might be encountering a, a very serious issue? Well, I think it's much easier for peers to recognize it because they actually witness the students using. Uh, the party scene is 
is where this happens. So friends know first. Friends know first. Uh, and it's very difficult for adolescents because there's a culture of silence and the worst thing you could possibly do is rat out another friend. Uh, the more mature true friend recognizes when another friend is suffering. As for parents, it is extremely hard at times. Um, my wife and I have asked ourselves over and over again, how could we not have seen? Here we are both educators and this is happening right in front of our eyes and we couldn't see it. What I can say is that adolescents are quite adept at concealing from their parents dysfunctional and self-destructive behaviors. They have a lot to hide and they develop ways of doing that. Susan and I were shocked when we learned that David was using. Uh, perhaps we shouldn't have been, but we were. There are things that parents can do to lessen the likelihood. There is much evidence that having dinner together with your children every night, even if it's just 30 minutes together, makes a real difference. Asking your children about their interests what they enjoy at school, not how they're doing at school. You get report cards, you'll know already, and they know that doing uh, better is better than doing worse. So uh, leaving performance out of it, but engagement at the center of the conversations is really important. Beyond that, if a child is old enough that they can go out tonight, uh, have a curfew for them, stick to the curfew, make sure that you see them when they come in, when you give them that hug before bed, look at their eyes, smell their breath, notice if they've been using. Every parent asks themselves whether the dysfunctional behaviors of their child is their fault. Mm -hmm. And very often you get into a dynamic with your child of the blame game. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you doing this? And that can come from the child to the parent or the parent to the child. How do you deal with the self-doubt and, the, um, and these repercussions which get into the, in the way of actually addressing anything? How, how did you deal with that? Well, it was extremely difficult for me. In fact, I did feel guilty. Uh, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My mother was an alcoholic and I was convinced that that part of David's genetic makeup that made him predisposed to addiction came from me. But furthermore, it was my decision to accept a job in Brentwood School to move the whole family from Northern California to Southern California. And I uh, chastised myself over and over again for creating a social pressure that might have made David turn to alcohol and drugs. One of the things you learn in this business though is nobody causes anybody else to use and nobody causes addiction. It is a complex brain disease. Uh, in Al-Anon uh, one learns that you didn't cause it and you can't cure it. All you can do is be supportive, set clear boundaries, uh, let your loved one know that you want them to be healthy and support healthy behaviors, not unhealthy behaviors. So in, in fact, is recovery something that not only David is going through, you're going through that as well. Susan is going through that. And, and as a matter of fact, the families of uh, people who have suffered from addiction, they're all part of, of this recovery process. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, alcoholism and addiction are often referred to as a family disease. And it is because the disease sets up codependencies. Uh, and the difficult thing is not allowing yourself to be dragged into the addict's dysfunction, right. but to have clear boundaries to support, but to detach from the behavior. It's as a parent even more difficult because your natural instinct is to help. But an addict will confound and vex your best instincts to be a loving parent. So isn't that by extension also the role of the community to also view itself as part of this, this group that is in recovery? Well, I think that is part of our role, but that also 
is a highly advanced social notion. And I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but there's certainly been a lot of progress. There's far more understanding today than there was before that this is a disease. It's not just people acting badly, although they are acting badly. Um, but yes, organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs, they can make a huge difference. Churches can make a huge difference. We do need to see this as a social problem. And the benefits of making a difference in this area is huge to society because of the cost of doing nothing. Well, and, and Napa County, its citizens, foundations, private citizens, mm -hmm. thought leaders, people who are engaged in this work, students, friends of students who are addicted, mm -hmm. all deserve a huge amount of credit. Michael Pratt, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, and thank you so much for your insights. My great pleasure. Thank you.